This is Techno, a show about innovations that can change lives. The science of fighting a wildfire. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, but we're doing it in a unique way. <laughs> this is a show about science. Oh, oh my God. By scientists. Oh. Tonight, Hell no, GMO. Techno investigates GMOs. You can't just tell me it's safe. Strawberries that battle bacteria. Tomatoes that resist spot. And apples that don't turn brown. So walk me through what it is about this strawberry plant. A new generation of genetically modified food sets off a new round of anger and fear. I should have punched you in the blank face. Now, Techno goes to the experimental fields where scientists must stay under the radar to conduct their research. People get excited about technology, whether it's in their phone or in their car. So why is it so weird on their plate? Kara Santa Maria is a neuroscientist. What if I told you that they were GMO strawberries? Huh. She'll show us the latest innovations. So these tomatoes here are special tomatoes. Then Dr. Shinny Somara is a mechanical engineer. She'll go inside the anti-GM movement. Do you trust scientists? And I'm Phil Torres. I'm an entomologist. You want to make a lab cocktail? That's our team. Now let's do some science. Hey guys, welcome to Techno. I'm Phil Torres, joined by Dr. Shinny Samara and Kara Santa Maria. So guys, let's jump right into it. GMOs, just three letters, but a whole lot of debate. And of course, we're talking about genetically modified organisms here. Anything from tiny bacteria to fish to even giant trees. And guys, this debate, it targets science and scientists. It's true, you know, the anti-GMO movement, it's, it's got a lot of street cred, it's very popular, but it's also really anti, I don't know another way to put it, it's anti-science. I covered the march against Monsanto and I was actually really kind of personally hurt that most people think that science is a really bad thing when it comes to GMO. Yeah, and let's be real, this is a sensitive one for us because we're scientists. But as scientists, we're trained to look at the data, and that's what we try to keep in mind as we investigated genetically modified foods. Genetically modified food. A subject that inspires controversy and fear. But one scientist is fighting back, trying to debunk one myth at a time, even if it means getting hate mail on a regular basis. I should have punched you in the blank face when I had the chance. If I come to Florida, I will make you and your family drink Roundup, stay the hmm out of Florida. I hope you and your family get brain cancer so you, you can see what it's like, sweet people. Where does all of this anger come from? I think the idea is, is to intimidate. And I think that you, if, if most scientists get this, they're unlikely to re-engage in public. Kevin Folta knows a thing or two about what exactly goes into genetically modified crops. After all, he is the head of the Department of Horticultural Sciences at the University of Florida, where researchers figure out new ways of growing fruits and vegetables. He's proud of the work, but also protective. He asked us not to disclose the location of these fields for fear that anti-GM activists would try to destroy them. You know that the World Trade Organization just this week said, no labels on me. The anti-GM movement is global. In the eyes of many protesters, Monsanto, the world's largest producer of genetically engineered seeds, has become nearly synonymous with GM food technology. There are currently eight GM crops commercially available in the US. Corn, soy, cotton, canola, alfalfa, sugar beets, papaya, and squash. Most of these are big ag crops that come from companies like Monsanto and DuPont. The big companies never do themselves any favors. They've been the last of the party to educate. They've been resistant in terms of transparency. And that's where folks like me kind of come into this. I'm no big corporate friend. I look at the data and we make decisions. And we try to distill for the public, what does the science tell us? And frequently it tells them a story they don't want to hear. 
One of those stories is about strawberries and how farmers in Florida battle diseases that GM crops could eliminate. What you're looking at are two of the major pathogens that infect strawberries here in the uh, state of Florida, mm -hmm. a fungal pathogen and a bacterial pathogen that devastated these plants. One of our big interests was how we could use a transgenic strategy or this GMO type strategy to fortify a strawberry against disease. And that's this plant here, because this plant sat in the same greenhouse, had the same warmth and the same water, but didn't get sick. So walk me through what it is about this strawberry plant that makes it resist the fungus and the bacteria. Well, plants have innate systems that help defend them against pests and pathogens. And this particular plant, all of these plants, have a gene called NPR1. The NPR1 gene is part of the strawberry's immune system and is expressed when a plant encounters a pathogen. But in Folta's GM strawberries, this gene is already turned on, allowing the plant to have greater resistance to disease. This plant thinks that, it's, that the infection has been ongoing, so it's essentially born thinking that it has a problem. And what's nice about that is that when a real pest or pathogen comes along, that plant's good to go. But growers already have a way to control diseases in strawberries. Conventional agriculture uses synthetic fungicides and antimicrobial sprays, while organic farmers can only use compounds made from naturally occurring elements, like copper, a heavy metal. Copper's not a very safe thing to ingest, is it? No, it's a heavy metal, and it's, uh, it's expensive. Um, you have to apply it. It does accumulate in the soil um, if you use it too much on the same soil. It has risks around water. One place where we could imagine something like that would be hugely valuable would be in, on an organic farm maybe a place where you can't use traditional fungicides. But under U.S. guidelines, organic farmers can't use GM plants. And currently, no farmers can grow Folta's transgenic strawberry at all. You've shown proof of concept, but they may never see a supermarket. Why is that? What we are getting good at is creating good solutions that really end up dying in the lab, mostly because of the fear of the technology and a very rigorous deregulation process. But strawberries aren't the only example from Florida's experimental fields. A transgenic tomato could be an answer to a major problem. So this is what bacterial spot does as it starts to take hold. This is the beginnings of it right here. Samuel Hutton is a tomato breeder at the University of Florida. He's been using genetic modification to battle a disease called bacterial spot. As the plant continues to get bigger, then the leaves will get worse and worse. Lower leaves that are green now will start to die off, and you'll have fruit on the bottom of the plant exposed, and those fruit are prone to sun scald. For tomato, that's our biggest problem in Florida. Hutton thinks he has a GM solution. So these tomatoes here are special tomatoes, right? Yeah. Yeah, this whole trial is set up as a comparison of transgenic tomatoes with non-transgenic varieties. So when you say transgenic, you're referring to? In this case, it's a pepper gene that was taken out of bell pepper and put into tomatoes, a gene that was not there originally. You heard it right. Scientists have inserted a pepper gene, known as the BS2, into tomatoes to make them resistant to bacterial spot disease. Do you think that if this were to go to market, that regular consumers would be more comfortable with the idea of a GMO tomato that has genes from a pepper. Yeah, it's a natural gene. We know the protein product. We know what it does. We know it's safe. And so something like that, a natural plant defense gene, it might come across uh, more palatable to some people. Palatable is key for researchers like Hutton and Folta, who hope crops which have been modified with only genes from other plants will lead the way toward GMO acceptance. And that's really kind of the sad part. There's only so many strawberries in the industry to produce uh, money for farmers. It's not the kind of thing that to go through the costly deregulatory process would really be worth it. So this NPR1 strawberry is not deregulated. That's right, not deregulated. Even though it looks delicious, it can't hurt you, um, you can't eat it. All right. have so sharply divided scientists and the public than genetically modified foods. You can't just tell me it's safe. I'm supposed to believe it. I'm not going to. A recent Pew survey revealed only 37% of Americans believe GM foods are safe. In contrast, 88% of scientists. 
the result of a fervent grassroots movement driven by activists like this retired school teacher. Scientists are trying to solve world food problems by genetically engineering them. Are you against that? I don't believe that. I believe they're trying to genetically modify food so they can own it all. Do you trust scientists? I feel like you have an aversion to them. Actually, some of them can be trusted, but I think a lot of them can't be trusted. In spite of assurances from scientists, based on hundreds of peer-reviewed studies in the two decades since GM foods became available, many people fear them. Three states have already passed laws requiring labels on all GM foods. So what is it that the public need to know? The public needs to know that something's going into their food that shouldn't really be there. The anti-GM movement is well organized. There are plenty of groups, plenty of passion, and plenty of information. Not all of it accurate. And you're dressed as a bee. This couple blames Monsanto for colony collapse syndrome. But when it came to providing supporting facts, they had few. And when we asked a very basic question... So what does GMO stand for? Genetically modified... Um, Genetic. Neither could answer. Genetically modified... Not organic. Oh my God, not it's organic. definitely not organic. <laughs> Much of the opposition has a target. Ag giant Monsanto or anyone associated with the company. In 2015, Rock and Neil Young released this video that went viral, lashing out at Starbucks. I like to start my day off without helping Monsanto. In the song, Young accuses Starbucks, along with Monsanto, of being part of an effort to overturn Vermont's GM labeling law. But Young may be wrong. Starbucks tells Techno it has not taken a position on GMO labeling. Feeling the backlash, food companies are increasingly jumping on the anti-GM bandwagon. Chipotle recently announced it would start phasing out GM ingredients from its menu. The fast food company is trying to avoid the so-called Monsanto effect, bad PR associated with GM foods. Techno asked Monsanto to participate in this report, but they declined. On the street, the company faces an information gap that is increasingly filled with seemingly incredible allegations. They want to control the seeds all over the world. So we believe that they also do weather manipulation with geoengineering in the sky. But they, we know that they're part of that. So if they can control the weather, they control the seeds, they control the world. I think they're confused. I think that when you make your focus to be anti-corporate, now you're slamming a technology that could be used by a guy like me or like anybody else to solve problems for people who desperately need it. Increasingly, scientists have become the target of the anti-GM movement. At least four university researchers were recently served a Freedom of Information Act order to release all of their university emails by a group called US Right to Know. One of them was University of Florida scientist Kevin Falter, who told Techno's Cara Santa Maria that part of the story. What are they looking for? What they say is, we need to know how far are the tentacles of collusion between the big ag companies and university scientists, how deep these go and what they're sharing. Are you funded by large companies like Monsanto? My laboratory has no funding from Monsanto or any of the big six big ag companies. I don't care who, and this is a big deal, you could not pay me to fake data. Yet the mistrust is evident. Some of it, fed by the internet, paints a picture of researchers and labs creating frightening science. During our interview with activist Lorna Paisley, you can hear how she mixes fact with fiction. They take viruses and bacteria and insecticides and put them into the DNA of our food that are totally unrelated. They're not even food most of the time. In an effort to demystify the science behind GMOs, Folta offered to show me how he makes his transgenic strawberries, using a technique involving something called, that's right, agrobacterium. Agrobacterium is a soil bacterium that we think of as nature's genetic engineer. What it does is a natural part of its life cycle is move part of its genome, so a piece of its genes, into a plant. So this is something that just happens all the time in nature? It does. It's a soil bacterium that's everywhere. But this, there's not just agrobacterium in this tube. You've actually done something to that agrobacteria. Right. Rather than agrobacterium inserting the gene it wants, 
I've asked Agrobacterium to insert the gene I want. So now what we'll do is, is very simple. All we're going to do is move our plant pieces into that medium. Do I put mine in the same tube? Sure, go ahead. So now once they're inside the medium, we just mm -hmm. give it a little shake. Okay. And we'll let it sit for an hour, and then when we come back, it's done. So that was pretty easy. We didn't, you know, hit it with any sort of radiation. We didn't do any, you know, use any scary chemicals. But this is plant tissue that is technically infected with a bacterium, but that bacterium has a property that is hopefully going to make the plant taste better. In this case, I think it's going to change fruit firmness, which is firmness. one of the major reasons we can't ship really good tasting strawberries is because they're too soft. So what is this going to grow up to look like? If you look in the back corner. Right here? This is kind of the after picture. They're so cute. Using GM technology, scientists can create a plant with new desirable traits in months, a process that can take conventional breeders years. And according to Folta, GM methods are more precise than conventional breeding. How many genes are being shuffled around when you're doing traditional breeding? Well, each plant background might have between 30 and 50,000 genes. And when you're doing genetic modification, you're making a GMO, you're making a transgenic plant, how many genes are you moving around? One, two, maybe three. It's always very strange to me that we can mix together whole genomes, 30,000, 80,000 genes, mix them together in ways we don't understand using conventional breeding. But if I move one gene, that I understand, that's the one people get upset about. That's what I always call the Frankenfood paradox. This might look like business as usual in the apple orchard rich state of Washington, but these trees planted in late spring 2015 are the first approved GM apple trees ever to grow on US soil. The company, Okanagan Specialty Fruits, would not reveal the exact location of the grove, but they did provide this footage. The apple is called the Arctic apple. The company also gave us this time-lapse footage demonstrating the attributes of the fruit. The apple on the right has been genetically modified, so despite the passage of time, it doesn't brown when it's been cut open. After 18 years of testing, the apple got the stamp of approval from the FDA, USDA, and EPA. Are these apples safe to eat? Yes, they're safe to eat. They've been rigorously tested by FDA, really to a fault. The apple was created by engineering its own DNA, so it produces less of an enzyme called PPO, which causes browning. By silencing, or turning off, genes that control production of PPO, scientists have essentially created a non-browning apple. Sounds like a neat party trick, but it could also help reduce food waste. The big question is, will consumers bite? The Arctic apple is important because it goes to the consumer rather than to the farmer. And I think this is really the first wave of products that we'll see targeted that way. When I think of sliced apples, I think of soccer moms bringing snacks to her children. Do you think that these soccer moms are gonna be frowned upon if they say, oh, those apples aren't turning brown, that's so neat, why is it? Oh, they're genetically modified. I think there's gonna be a lot of soccer moms who freak out, but at the same time, you got science moms, and science moms are a pretty persuasive bunch. We wanted to see what people know and feel about GMOs, so we hit the streets with Folta and asked them, would you eat a GM fruit if it was offered to you? So if I were to send some strawberries home with you, would you eat them? Yes. What if I told you that they were GMO strawberries? Huh. Would you eat them? It sounds freaky. So it sounds a little freaky? Yeah. What do you know about GMOs? Nothing. I know organic's the way to go, just with all the hormones and everything like that. On, But I don't know a ton about GMOs, to be honest. They say a whole bunch of stuff can affect kids and different things like that. What you're saying is exactly what we hear from so many mothers. Um, you know, I worry about, um, you know, the health of my child. That's a very common concern and a very yeah. common thought. But I guess, the, do you know how many people have uh, been sick or died from GMOs over the 18 years they've been used? No. Can no you think, how would you feel if it was zero? A lot more comfortable. A lot more <laughs> yes, comfortable. That's good. Yeah. That's good. People get excited about technology, whether it's in their phone or in their car. So why is it so weird on their plate? This is where we have to think about that as scientists. How do we make them more comfortable with using technology? So what do you think it's gonna take, I mean, for this to get wide acceptance? For me, I think that acceptance will come when it's a trait that consumers can relate to and uh, affects a crop that they really care about. I really feel that citrus may be the first domino. 
As Techno's Marita Davison first reported in 2014, a deadly disease called citrus greening is already devastating Florida's orange groves. Genetically modified oranges could be the solution that saves the industry. The first question I want to know is, would you eat this orange? Yes. You like oranges? Yep. So we're in Florida, and almost all the trees are infected and dying. Oh. And now, let's, let me ask you this. If it was a gene that came from spinach yeah. that you eat in all your spinach salads, and you know it's safe because it's, we've been eating it for years, and a scientist is telling you. <laughs> How about that? Um, I would, I guess, I don't know. I guess there's really no other option if the orange trees are just dying anyway. Researchers at Texas A&M have shown promising results by inserting a spinach gene into orange trees in order to make them resistant to the disease. But it's a race against time. GM oranges can take years before they can be planted and bear fruit. Meanwhile, over 80% of Florida's orange trees are infected and could be wiped out within a decade. There's a sense of urgency for us to produce a solution. Manjul Dutt is a citrus researcher who's working on solutions that could speed up Mother Nature. Like the GM technology behind this purple lime, this transgenic lime gets its ruby color from another fruit. It's the same gene that produces the red color in grapes. But the color isn't just for fun. It helps GM researchers figure out if their gene transfers have been successful. We started working with that gene to use it as a selectable marker. You can have a cultured dish that has you know, 10 million cells growing out, and you can individually go and pick the ones that are purple in color and so, just discard the ones that are not. And so this is really a way to, in the earliest stages, know which of your plants are, you know, have the gene of interest, which ones don't. Absolutely. These purple limes also have a second transgene taken from another citrus fruit, the clementine. It's called the FT gene. This enhanced FT gene allows citrus trees to mature faster. Dutt showed me an example of a three-month-old seedling. So as a layperson, I look at this and I'm like, oh, it's a cute little plant. But if I were a farmer, it would blow my mind <laughs> to see these small seedlings already at a flowering stage. Absolutely, absolutely. In contrast, seedlings without the FT gene can take seven to eight years before they flower and start bearing fruit. If scientists are able to speed up the aging process of citrus plants, they could more quickly confirm whether some varieties of GM oranges are resistant to citrus greening and save the Florida orange. Not to mention, purple margaritas could be the next big thing. You want to make a lab cocktail? Oh, absolutely. Let's do it. Meanwhile, scientists will continue basic research on fruits like this, so they'll have GM crops waiting in the wings for when the public wants or needs them. I think we've learned that a disease shows up, you better have something ready to combat it, rather than kind of looking for a solution after the disease is there. Because we're talking about possibly having these GM foods end up at our homes. Kara, you snuck a bite. What was it like? Tasted like a strawberry. I mean, it was a really good strawberry. I don't think it was because it was genetically modified. I think that Kevin just knows how to grow a good strawberry. I think anything that involves a laboratory, a Petri dish, and a pipette is going to scare people because it's to do with their food. And people just want to grow it and eat it. I mean, yeah, to be fair, when you see a Petri dish, you don't necessarily get hungry. When you see a... <laughs> you know, a beautiful cornfield and somebody who looks like it's their family farm, you're like, kid, that's what I want to eat. There are many things that concern me about GMO, but one of the strongest things is the fact that, you know, the innovation is brilliant and the work that the scientists do is brilliant. Genetically modifying anything is pioneering, but we don't know the implications and the implications are so complex. It's many degrees removed from just taking a gene. You know, it's altering ecosystems, and we don't know how that's happening. And that is one of the struggles here, is the environmental implications that these things can potentially have. And that's what we're trying to understand. But if you look at the amount of pesticides or antibiotics, things like that that we're dumping into our ecosystems, and we've been doing for decades, and you compare that to using GM crops, Lots of times, they, they don't quite balance out. Definitely. Guys, obviously a complicated and fascinating topic, and we'll continue to follow the science and the controversy to keep you up to date on the debate. That's it for now. Join us next time here on Techno. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google+, and more.